Thank you very much, uh, Matis. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be back here in Estonia. Um, I recognize some of your faces from last time, uh, so I apologize that uh, you might have heard this uh, before, but repetition isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. So um, I'll just check everything's working. Just a little bit of geography, uh, first of all. Um, in case you're wondering, this is Shetland. It lies almost exactly uh, midway between Norway and Scotland. And in fact, it's uh, the same distance from Lerwick uh, to Bergen as it is to Aberdeen. Lerwick is the capital of Shetland. And Porsound in the Faroe Islands is also exactly the same distance. Uh, the islands played a very important role in the Allied war effort during the Second World War, especially after Germany invaded Norway on the 9th of April 1940. Then the islands found themselves on the front line. And just another slide, another bit of geography. There we go. Um, this is just to point out the relative position of, Scot of Shetland and Estonia, uh, just to help you uh, mentally place the events that I'm going to tell you about. So Estonia, just under 60 degrees, Shetland, just above 60 degrees. On the 9th of April, Germany launched Operation Weser Übung, which was a joint operation involving the German Army, Navy, and Air Force to take over Norway. The main reason for the German invasion was to ensure that the Allies would not be able to blockade Germany, as they'd done successfully in World War I, and to secure the port of Narvik, which supplied um, a great deal of the iron ore that the Germans needed. Germany was also worried that Britain might violate Norway's neutrality and occupy the country, and there had been some evidence of that leading up to the invasion. The towns of Bergen, Christiansand, Stavanger, Trondheim, and Narvik quickly fell into German hands. However, the British responded on the 10th of April uh, when five British destroyers attacked the Germans in Narvik. The Germans lost two destroyers, but the British had to withdraw. Then on the 13th of April, the British war uh, warship, the HMS Warspite, and seven destroyers again attacked the Germans at Narvik. Narvik was a very uh, important uh, place. This turned out to be a success, and the seven remaining German destroyers were sunk. On the 16th and 17th of April, there were British landings at Namsos and Ondalsnes in order to launch an attack on Trondheim. However, this wasn't a success. And it became clear that southern and central Norway were securely in German hands. And the result was that on the 27th of April, British forces were commanded to evacuate south and central Norway. This evacuation was completed by the 1st and 2nd of May, and then on the 3rd of May, Norwegian forces in the south and center of Norway surrendered. However, northern Norway still remained largely unoccupied. The situation changed when on the 10th of May, 1940, the Germans opened their campaign in France and Churchill, who was the UK prime minister, um, became, well, he became prime minister. And clearly the proximity of the Germans to the south of England focused minds and on the 25th of May, Churchill instructed Major General Ochenlech to evacuate northern Norway as well. However, just before the evacuation was to take place, he was also ordered to attack Narvik again to cover the withdrawal of British troops and to deny Germany future iron ore exports. On the 28th of May, the Allied troops took Narvik, which they held until the 8th of June when they withdrew. With no other prospect of uh, British involvement, King Haakon of Norway and the Norwegian government also withdrew from Tromsø in the north of Norway and went into exile in the UK. On the 10th of June, Norway formally capitulated two months after Weserubung. Okay, so this is the background to the Shetland battle. Despite ultimately being unsuccessful, the British attack on Narvik did prove that the Germans were not invulnerable. However, the losses on both sides proved high. The British lost 4,500 men, three cruisers, eight destroyers, 
an aircraft carrier and 112th aircraft. Um, the French and Poles lost 500 men each, and the Norwegians lost 1,800 men. While on the Axis side, the Germans lost 5,000 men, three cruisers, 10 destroyers, four U-boats, and 242 aircraft. Considering the relative sizes of the navies, the loss of ships was actually more of a problem to Germany than it was to the British at that point. However, despite this, the Germans had completed their conquest of Norway. And according to Hitler, Norway was now to become a zone of destiny. Uh, Hitler was actually very keen to have Norwegians, which he saw as good Aryans, as part of his Reich. And he originally wanted to treat them reasonably well. However, holding on to Norway, which was a priority for Hitler, meant that a large German occupation force was tied up in Norway during the war, defending Norway's extensive coastline. The invasion and subsequent occupation of Norway led to an exodus of Norwegians who didn't want to associate themselves with Hitler's plans for their country. Some headed east and some headed west. And it's the ones heading west that we're really going to deal with. However, before I do that, I'd just like to mention that the largest numbers of Norwegians actually headed east over Norway's long land border with Sweden. And during the war, more than 50,000 Norwegians fled in that direction, where um, they actually were trained by uh, the Norwegians uh, in cooperation with the Swedish government um, to go back into Norway at the end uh, of the war. However, from the perspective of Shetland, what's particularly interesting is that many of those fled west. Those who went east tended to come from the eastern side of Norway, which makes uh, a lot of sense. However, those who lived along the Norwegian west coast, the most logical way of escaping was to head west into the North Sea. And many chose to head west in small boats to Britain, particularly to Shetland, which, as you can see, is almost an offshore archipelago of Norway. And this group became known in Norway as the Englandsfarere, or the England Farers. Most of those who headed west were young, unmarried men, on average between the ages of 19 and 23. They left their homeland mainly with the aim of joining the Allies so that they could return to Norway and fight the Germans. About 10% were women. They came from the entire length of the Norwegian West Coast. However, some communities were particularly notable for the number of people who decided to head for Shetland. For example, the small island of Vigra, which had a population of around 1,200, and between 70 and 80 of that uh, population headed west. And from the fishing village of Pelevog, near Bergen, with a population of about 400, some 50 people followed suit. And overall, over the course of the, the war, about 5,000 people headed west in military and civilian vessels. About 300 Norwegian civilian boats, mostly small fishing boats, were involved, and they carried 3,300 of these 500. 16 boats sank, 137 people died, um, 13 expeditions with 121 people were taken by the enemy, and of these, 51 were executed for daring to try and escape, and nine died in captivity. Many of those who assisted were sent into exile or executed, and the total cost of human life was over 320 Norwegian dead. The flotilla of boats started to head west to Shetland as soon as the Germans had launched their Operation Weser Ubung. And they brought a variety of different people with them. They brought refugees, and they brought British and Norwegian servicemen. And the port of call for these boats was Lerwick Harbor. And Lerwick Harbor has kept uh, good records of the boats that were coming in so that um, we can trace where they came from, the names of the boats, and who they brought with them. So I'd like to just give you an example of that uh, just now. Between the 3rd 
and the 28th of May, they recorded the following boats and whom they brought on the boats. So it's just to give you an idea of the types of people. So 3rd of May, the Borgund from Olesund with 42 German prisoners of war. On the 4th of May, the Jovak from Olesund with 20 people and the Boma with 12 refugees. On the 5th of May, the Bjerk, these are all the names of boats, by the way, I should have pointed that out, which was a guard boat. It arrived with a doctor, two medical uh, students, and five Danish volunteers. On the 6th of May, the Veststein from Molloy with eight people, including four soldiers who had taken part in the fighting near Voss. On the 9th of May, three boats arrived, the Violet, the Porak from Pelleborg with two people, then the Schöguten from Portnaborg with eight, 19 people, among whom were an Air Force captain and his staff. And so on it goes. The 10th of May is particularly interesting. The Vita arrived from Bremnes with six people, four of whom were naval officers. The Havorn, a hub urn from Molle arrived with 20 people, among whom were 11 British soldiers who'd arrived from Ondalsnes, two Jews from Austria who'd come from Oslo, so they'd escaped from Austria to Oslo. Then the Germans had arrived and they'd moved um, up to the west coast of Norway and escaped uh, in that direction. And seven Norwegians. Then, um, and so on. Okay. It's just to give you an idea for the number of boats that suddenly started to appear from Norway. There hadn't been any before this. And then suddenly these boats start to arrive into, into Lerwick. Just a few more examples. Finishing with this particular list, on the 28th of May, the Bresund from Olesund arrived again. Um, well, it didn't actually arrive in Lerwick. It sank off the coast of Unst, which is the island in the north of Shetland. Um, but m luckily, the passengers uh, were saved and they were brought into Lerwick, uh, where their names were taken down. All in all, during 1940, 56 boats fled from Norway, of which 30 arrived in Shetland. Some others went in other directions. A couple arrived in the Faroe Islands. A couple arrived in the north coast of Scotland. But 30 of the boats arrived in Shetland. And they carried 200 refugees, 100 British servicemen, and Norwegian service personnel. And of the boats, these are the main places that they came from. 11 came from Olesund, seven from Bergen, Sutra and Stavanger, five from Molloy, four from Flure and Selia, and three from Bumlu and Karmoy. So, actually there's a, there's a slide missing, I'll just carry on. Um, the number of boats started to uh, increase um, in 1941. So nearly four times as many boats arrived uh, from Norway, 191 in all mostly in the months of August and September. And of these, 120 arrived in Lerwick, carrying 1,880 refugees, including 155 women and 24 children. Uh, for example, the Bofjord from Axvall arrived in Lerwick on the 10th of June with 12 people. And the boat had been purchased by the Orsta Brun Export Group. I'll tell you what those were just uh, uh, shortly. One of the groups who organized clandestine refugee escapes among the escapees were fisherman Ger Gerhard Bergsdijk and machinist Pe uh, Peter Sira, who went on to take part in the Norwegian motor torpedo boat operations against the Germans, which were organized from Lerwick. Okay, so people, we actually know the names of people who came across and then were involved in further fighting against the Germans. Now, this didn't go down well with the German uh, authorities in Norway, and to try and halt the exodus on the 26th of September, 1941, the Germans extended the death penalty to anyone attempting to leave Norway. And as you might expect, that had an effect. In 1942, only 17 boats left Norway. However, refugees continued to be picked up by boats involved in the Shetland bus missions. For example, even as late as the winter of 1944-45, 225 refugees were brought back to Shetland from Norway on the Shetland bus subchasers. Well, what was to be done with all these refugees suddenly arriving in Little Shetland? Well, initially, the focus uh, for looking after 
uh, the Norwegians fell on a certain James Garrick, who was the Norwegian vice consul. He had to house them, feed them, and sometimes clothe them because they'd escaped with virtually nothing. Um, for his uh, efforts, he was awarded um, a, a high honor and the order of St. Olaf first class. Um, and after being registered, the Norwegians, um, after they'd been fed and watered and dried off, they were quickly sent south to the Royal Victoria Patriotic School in Wandsworth, London, where they were interviewed. And anyone who um, turned out to be a quizling was weeded out. Now, soon a camp was also established at James Sutherland's herring station at the foot of Brown's Road in Lerwick. Not very interesting for you, perhaps, but the Shetlanders were interested to know where this uh, camp was set up. <laughs> and most of the Norwegians went there first. In London, many of the Norwegians were persuaded to join the war effort. Some were recruited into the commando unit called the Norwegian Independent Company, formed in March 1941, which was a British special operations executive uh, group, better known as the Company Linge, after its uh, leader, Captain Martin Linge. Many of the people uh, came back to Shetland where some joined the Norwegian Air Force, which was actually based at Solum Vo, which is uh, to the north, uh, northern part of Shetland. Um, about 600 Norwegians were based there. Um, others joined the Shetland bus, which we're about to come to. Others didn't make it as far as Shetland, but settled um, in fishing communities along the coast of Scotland and continued to work as fishermen uh, during the war. And there were about three to 400 Norwegians living in a little village called Bucky in the northwest, uh, sorry, the northeast of Scotland. Now, I mentioned export groups. In Norway, clandestine groups appeared in a number of areas to organize help for the refugees, finding boats and provisions. Um, but it was a very dangerous activity, as you can imagine. Um, here's the names of some of these groups. In Bergen, there was the Orsta, Brun, and the Stein groups. And in Olesund, there was the Dumlu and Bremnes groups and the Torsvik and Vala uh, groups. Unfortunately, as Germany um, improved their intelligence in Norway during 1942, most of the export groups were eliminated. And the fate of the Stein Organisationen was particularly sad, um, so it's maybe worth uh, mentioning this. Its leader was Christian Elias Stein, and it had around 1,500 members based in and around Bergen. Unfortunately, it was infiltrated by a Gestapo agent um, called Marino Nielsen, who arrived in Bergen from Olesund at the beginning of 1941, pretending that he needed to escape. He passed inf information to the Gestapo, and 200 men were arrested and taken to Bergen uh, prison. I won't go into details, but um, from Bergen, they were... Uh, they were moved around to different camps and ended up in Sachsenhausen. And of the group, 51 out of the 200 um, died in addition to those who were shot, including Christian Elias Stein. So it was dangerous to attempt to escape from Norway and it was dangerous to help people to escape from Norway. But now we come to the Shetland bus. After the Vézerubon, the British authorities were aware of small boats arriving from Norway. And plans were quickly developed to use them in the war effort. By November 1940, the Special Operations Executive, which is usually just short to the SOE, um, which had been established earlier in that year by Churchill to, wear, to wage clandestine warfare behind enemy lines, um, had decided to establish a secret uh, group called ME7, Military Establishment 7, which would be based in Shetland. Captain Leslie Mitchell was sent to organize the operation and he requisitioned um, a building called Flemington, uh, now Kergord House, as his secret headquarters. And later, he appointed a certain David Howarth, who has written an account of the Shetland bus as his second in command. Now, the Shetland bus is the English name for the operation that was established, the secret op op um, operation. However, in Norwegian, the name is Shetland's Jengen, 
of the Shetland gang, which um, gives you an impression of the type of uh, people that were involved in it and the fact that although it was um, a dangerous uh, activity to be involved in, there was an element of daring do as well, young men doing heroic uh, deeds. Now, Mitchell's first mission was just before Christmas 1940, so it's not that long after the German uh, invasion. And he sent the Vita under skipper Hilmar Langeun, who had been a member of one of these um, export groups, the Orsta Brun export group, and he made a trip to Nordhordaland, which is just across the sea from Shetland. Um, he went over and he returned to Shetland on Christmas Day successfully without having uh, met with any uh, disasters. By May 1941, when Sub-Lieutenant David Howarth arrived, they had managed to gather six boats available for action. And they'd already carried out 13 trips successfully to the Norwegian coast from Dumlu to Trondheim. That's quite a, a wide area of the Norwegian coast. Now, these trips had taught them that the missions would have to be carried out during the winter months in darkness when the weather was at its worst. Um, also, as the German aircraft made many patrols along the coast, out to about 50 nautical miles offshore, the boats had to reach the 50 mile distance as darkness fell so that they would, could get into a believable fishing position before daybreak so as not to raise suspicion. Okay? So they were pretending to be fishing, Norwegian fishing boats. Um, well, they were Norwegian fishing boats, but they were pretending to be actually fishing uh, so that they could join in with the fleet of Norwegian fishing boats. Lerwick itself, followed by the little fjord of Katfirth, had been used as the base for the first expeditions, but for various reasons, they were proven to be unsuitable and a new base uh, was needed. And Lunna, with its little sheltered harbor um, and its distance from prying eyes, because remember, this has to be a secret uh, activity, and a large mansion house to act as a headquarters and crew accommodation was chosen. And by the end of July 1941, Lunna was ready as the, the big base uh, for the Shetland bus. And the first trip from Lunna was organized at the end of April, sorry, the end of August 1941. And August Nairoy commanded the 65 foot long boat, the Axel, um, which had only just arrived from Norway. And his mission was to deliver a messenger to a point north of Bergen in order to reestablish contact with the Norwegian underground. So this gives you a flavor of um, what they were supposed to be doing. It was a clandestine secret organization taking messages across to Norway to contact the underground in Norway. This was done and the, um, the crew had a very successful um, trip and they actually uh, went to a dance on one of the islands and uh, got to know the, the local girls. So I see it was a gang of young men, okay? The Axel returned successfully from Norway on the 5th of November. A number of ships were acquired uh, to go from Lunna. Um, the Siglaos, the Norsjön, the Arthur, the Erkna, the Heland, the Olaf and the Jak. And new skippers were, were uh, brought into the organization, including Leif Larsen, who was uh, mentioned um, earlier. During the winter of 1941-42, they carried out 40 trips, so 40 clandestine trips across the sea, 43 agents were landed, nine were picked up, and very importantly, 130 tons of arms were put ashore in Norway, and 45 refugees were brought over. Despite these early successes, this was a very dangerous operation, as they had to avoid being attacked by the Germans, um, they had the weather to contend with, and they also had the problem of people, quislings in Norway, telling the Germans what was happening. So there were losses, and the first ship to be lost was the Vita in September 1941. She was seized and the crew was interned. In October 1941, the Norsjön was lost, having set mines north of Trondheim. Luckily, the crew escaped, 
uh, stole another fishing boat, the Arthur, and returned to Shetland. However, the crew of the Blia were not so lucky. In November 1941, the Blia disappeared in a ferocious storm, and the 42 on board were all lost. And in fact, the boat disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to the boat. And that included six crew members and 32 refugees. So even if you made it onto a boat as a refugee, there was no guarantee that you would get successfully across to Norway. But it wasn't only dangerous for the Shetland bus boat crews. Any association with the Shetland bus operation could end in tragedy, such as the events that happened in the small fishing settlement of Telavog exactly 75 years ago and two months. On the 26th of April 1942, after having discovered that Lauritz and Marta Tella were hiding two men from the Linge company, um, Sir Arna Meldalvarum and Emily Gustav Kval, who'd arrived on a boat from Shetland, the Gestapo arrived to arrest them. Shots were exchanged and two prominent German Gestapo agents, uh, sorry, officers, were shot dead. Varum was also killed in the incident and Kval was executed a few months later. Now, Reichskommissar Josef Terboven, um, who controlled the Nazi regime in Norway, decided to make a, uh, an example of Televog. And um, the reprisal, which happened, was quick and brutal. On the 30th of April, all the buildings in the village were destroyed. All the boats were sunk or confiscated. All the livestock was taken away. And 72 men were deported to Sachsenhausen, of which 31 died in captivity. 268 women and children were imprisoned for two years, and 18 Norwegian prisoners held at Trandum internment camp were executed as a reprisal. And Televog joins um, the villages of Oradour, Surglan in France, Lidice in the Czech Republic, and Putin in the Netherlands as examples of uh, villages that were destroyed as in reprisals by the Germans. During 1942, the Shetland bus operations were moved again in Shetland, and they were moved from Lunna to Scalloway, where I live. Now, Lunna had proven to be just too isolated, too lacking in repair facilities, and to be honest, too boring for the young men who were involved in this operation. It was sapping their morale. Scalloway was a um, was a better prospect for the staff of roughly 30 British and 70 Norwegians. The village had people to socialize with, or in fact, girls to socialize with. Uh, there was accommodation available in the old net store. Um, there was somewhere to store the ammo. And most importantly, there was the engineering workshop of Jack Moore, which became entirely devoted to maintaining the bus boats. And ultimately, there were uh, nine Shetlanders and six Norwegians employed looking after the boats at the yard. All that Scalloway lacked was a slipway for the boats. And this was quickly built and officially named the Prince Olaf Slipway in October 1942 when the Norwegian Crown Prince came to Shetland to open it. And from that point, the Shetland bus boats um, left Lunna and came to Scalloway. And here's an example of some of them. There's the Heyland. This is it off the coast of Norway on one of its operations. Funny to think of these as warships. And the Axel, that's in uh, Scalloway being done up. Okay. Now, although the, that's not one of the Shetland bus uh, boats. Although the bus operations uh, were being transferred to Scalloway, Lunna was used as the base from which to launch um, a famous David and Goliath attack on the German battleship, the Tirpitz, which weighing, it, weighing in at 42,000 tons um, was a very intimidating threat to British uh, shipping. It posed a great threat to Allied forces in the North Sea, and it was tying up British, the British Navy in Scapa Flow in Orkney. So an attempt was made using a, a Shetland bus boat to sink it. Um, and the Arthur, captained by Leif Larsen, sailed to Norway on the 26th of October with two mini subs called chariots. That's one of them there. Um, and their British crews. They were going to attempt to 
launch these. Uh, they're really manned torpedoes and uh, sink the battleship. Unfortunately, within five miles of the battleship and still undetected, the subs were lost due to bad weather. And they had to scuttle the Arthur and they made it ashore and headed for, uh, for Sweden. Um, so later on, the Tirpitz was uh, severely damaged by other types of small um, uh, submarines. But it shows you the, the type of ambition that the members of the Shetland bus had, that they could even think that they might have an opportunity to sink something like that. The winter of 1942-43 was an increasingly tragic time for the bus. The Axel sank 200 miles north of Shetland, and the Sandoy and Feia were lost with all hands. The Bratholm eh, had also been lost with only one survivor. Half of the Freya's crew had been lost, and the Arthur had to be scuttled, and the Bergholm had sunk with the loss of a man. Uh, basically, over half the fleet of, uh, shift, uh, of fishing boats had been lost with about half the crew. The losses were actually getting too heavy to bear. Uh, German defences had improved. Fuel oil was so scarce in Norway that the larger fishing boats had given up fishing, which meant that the larger Shetland bus boats were just too obvious. They just appeared and they, they shouldn't have been there. So it was becoming increasingly clear that the operation couldn't continue for much longer if it remained reliant on the fishing boats. However, they had proved their effectiveness. They carried out almost 100 missions in total. Um, However, 10 boats were lost and 44 men had been lost in these due to winter weather and German surveillance. However, the, the operation hadn't finished. Shetland bus hadn't finished because the Americans came to the rescue. And in August 1943, uh, Admiral Nimitz, the commander in chief of the American naval forces in Europe, ordered three sub chasers powered by twin 1,200 horsepower engines to be sent to Britain and given to the Shetland bus. And they were given Norwegian island names, the Hesse, the Hitra, and the Vigra. And they proved to be highly successful. Um, and they continued taking men and weapons and arms across to Norway. They were much better armed than the fishing boats, as you can see. They had cannons at both stern and bow and a Colt machine gun on each uh, bridge wing. However, their main advantage over fishing boats was that they were much quicker. So a fishing boat could achieve five knots, uh, but a sub chaser could reach 16 knots. It could get in much quicker and come away again much more quickly. And once these were brought into service, not a single man or vessel was lost during the remainder of the war. In the winter of 1943-44, they proved their worth, making 34 trips, landing 41 agents and picking up 13 and rescuing a number of refugees. And in the winter of 1944-45, they landed another 94 agents, picked up 33 and rescued 225 uh, refugees. Okay. So there can be no doubt that the operation was a success. In all, 198 trips were made to Norway. Over 383 tons of military equipment were transported, which was then used against the Germans. And this amounted to, the, the, to most of the weapons, in fact, and materials used in southern Norway by the Norwegian home front. This is where they got their stuff. In addition, 192 agents were landed who were carrying out clandestine activities in Norway and um, finding out information that could be given uh, to the Allies. And 73 agents were returned, those who'd been discovered, they were managed to escape. And all in all, 373 refugees uh, were brought to safety. However, the most important thing about the Shetland bus was that it was immensely important for propaganda, bringing hope to occupied Norway. It also played its part in British military policy towards Norway a policy which involved planning small and large-scale operations against the Germans, which did its bit to convince Hitler that the British were going to return to the European mainland in force through Norway. Uh, in fact, during 1941-42, 
the British did consider Norway as a location for the potential second front. And in 1942, Hitler demanded that the German army and air force in Norway be reinforced and coastal defenses be strengthened. Um, it, because this was his zone of destiny, you see, he had to hang on to, to Norway. And between the middle of 1941 and June 44, there were between nine and 12 German divisions in the country. But by 1945, there were a total of 15 divisions, which is a huge number of troops. Um, so that's 340,000 German troops were in Norway doing nothing. Um, and also much of the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, were based in Norway as well. So they were tied up. So you can imagine that the German army and navy might have been more successfully used somewhere else if they hadn't uh, been stuck. Um, however, we also have to remember that 40, 44 crewmen lost their lives and um, they're commemorated uh, twice a year in Scalloway. Everyone involved with the bus was a hero. These are two of them, Corey Everson and Leif Larsen. And between them, they made over 100 trips to Norway. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic of these, um, of the ones that Larsen made, um, and the, the one that best shows his will and determination was his mission to Trena in Norland in March 1943. A resistance group was based in Trena, and Larsen's task as skipper of the Bergholm was to land three agents and four tons of uh, arms and equipment. On the way back to Shetland, Larsen's boat was attacked by two German planes and left in a sinking condition. Although five of the eight-man crew aboard were hit, they got into a clumsy uh, little rowing boat and they were 75 miles from the nearest point on the Norwegian coast, 350 miles from Shetland. And Larsen decided that as they had friends in the Ålesund area, which was 150 miles away, they would row, even on, although only three of them were fit. Two men rowed at one time while the third looked after the wounded. And sadly, one of them, Niels Vika, died of his injuries and had to be buried at sea. After rowing for four days, they reached the Olesund area, and sometime later, they were picked up and saved by a motor <laughs> torpedo boat sent from Lerwick in Shetland to pick them up. Today, this era in Norwegian history is remembered in Bergen with the sculpture of Leif Larsen, and in Olesund, there's a memorial to the Englands Farere, who took these fragile boats to seek freedom and safety. While in Scalloway, we have the Shetland Bus uh, Memorial, which has seen its share of important visitors, including Queen Sonia of Norway, who visited in 2007, and the Norwegian Prime Minister Stoltenberg, who visited in 2012. There are two excellent museums that each in their own way tell the story of this extraordinary period. In the rebuilt village of Televog, there's the Nordsjöfart Museum, the North Sea Maritime Museum, which uh, opened on the 26th of April, 1998, which was 50 years after the shootout between the Linga boys and the Gestapo. And it has a permanent exhibition dealing with the Televog uh, tragedy. And in Scalloway, we have the Scalloway Museum, uh, which is owned by the Shetland Bus uh, Friendship Society, which is uh, a charity which was set up about mm, 15 years ago um, to raise money for a memorial and then raise money to establish a museum. So it's very much part of the local story and the local history of the village of Scalloway and the island group of Shetland and the west coast of Norway and it links us all uh, together. But what are the boats themselves? Not many of the boats survive. I believe there's three. There's one I haven't got a picture of there. Um, however, the fishing boat, the MK Andholmen, um, which braved gales and German attacks which, and crossed eight times to Norway, still survives, as does the sub-chaser, the Hitra, which carried out uh, 43 uh, missions. So just to finish off, the Shetland bus story is a story of refugees escaping Nazi terror, of young men wanting to uh, leave Norway so that he can go back and take part in fights uh, with the Norwegians. 
and of a local community in Shetland which supported uh, this clandestine um, organization and activity. So, thank you very much. <laughs>